Welcome to today's webinar, Overview of K-12 Competency-Based Education, brought to you by NCSL. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Sunny Day. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you. Welcome to the webinar, Overview of K-12 Competency-Based Education. My name is Sunny Day. I'm a program principal with the Education Program at the National Conference of State Legislatures, and I will be moderating the webinar today. Before we begin, I want to highlight the Media Resource Library where you can download today's slides. You can find this by clicking the play button at the top in the upper right quadrant and that will drop down the media resources. I also want to encourage participants to ask questions. So at any point during the webinar, please enter your questions in the chat box and our presenters will have two opportunities during today's webinar to address as many of them as possible. We have a great audience today with participants from more than 20 states, and we're glad to have you here today to learn about competency-based education. Today's webinar is sponsored by the NCSL Student-Centered Learning Commission, a bipartisan group of state legislators studying legislative policy options, obstacles, and recommendations to help state legislators move forward with systems that support student-centered learning opportunities. Student-centered learning generally means that learning is personalized, learning is competency-based, learning takes, time, takes place anytime, anywhere, and students have ownership over their learning. The Commission would like to thank the Nellie May Education Foundation for sponsoring our work and this webinar. This first Commission webinar will provide an overview of competency-based education for state legislators and state legislative staff. Our intent today is to explore the definition of competency education, understand why states, districts, and schools are making this transition, and learn how competency-based approaches more effectively prepare students for post secondary success. Today we are lucky to have two of the preeminent national experts on competency education and the co-founders of Competency Works, Susan Patrick and Chris Sturgis. Susan Patrick is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the International Association for K-12 Online Learning, also known as INACOL. INACOL is a nonprofit providing policy advocacy, publishing research, developing quality standards, and driving the transformation to personalized, competency-based, blended, and online learning forward. You will also get to hear from Chris Sturgis, principal of MetisNet, a consulting firm based in Santa Fe, New Mexico, specializing in education, youth issues, and community engagement. Chris is a prolific writer on competency-based education based on visits to schools and interviews with leaders in the field. We've designed this webinar in two, two sections. During the first, we will learn about the field of competency-based education, and during the second, we will talk specifically about opportunities in the Every Student Succeeds Act to advance competency-based education. In between, we will have time to address your questions with a second opportunity for Q&A at the end of the webinar. So again, feel free to type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we will address as many of them as possible. With that, I'll turn it over to Susan for the first section of the webinar. Susan? Thank you, Sunny. Uh, I'll be leading today's presentation, and Chris and I will engage in discussions during two question and answer periods, one about halfway through and another at the end. So welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. We're going to be examining competency-based education in K-12. through And when we're looking at what the focus is here, it's about designing an education system for the future that will ensure all of our students are ready for the 21st century economy, the future of jobs and can see in college careers and our civic society. So let's get started. What we hope to accomplish today is take a look at what is and what isn't competency-based education, how it's advancing across the country. We have been exploring the development 
across the United States and all 50 states. Uh, looking at the relationship between competency-based education and personalized learning approaches, the second part of the webinar will focus on policy. What are the opportunities in state policy under the Every Student Succeeds Act for competency-based education? And also looking at what are states doing that are leading the way for policy strategies that legislators can use to advance competency education. So let's get started. There's a national conversation underway about how the traditional education system is no longer matched to the demands of the modern workforce. To understand competency-based education, it helps to start by examining how the traditional system is designed for sorting. If you think of students moving through our uh, traditional education systems, students are awarded A to F grades. A grade is given. Students move on regardless of all of the critical concepts were mastered or not. In schools all across the United States, we have ninth graders coming in that may be at a fifth grade math level, a fourth grade math level, or maybe even a tenth grade math level. This traditional system is based on a fixed mindset, not a growth mindset. It is time-based, so we hold time as the constant and learning as the variable with students moving through with huge gaps sometimes in their knowledge. These ADA upgrading systems depend on extrinsic motivation. There is high variability in how teachers determine proficiency from school to school, from classroom to classroom, even within the same grades and subjects. And it's really organized for efficiently delivering content. So what is competency-based education? The five-part working definition for competency-based education sorry, is focused on all students advancing upon demonstrated mastery. It's about students all being felt held to the same high uh, standards, knowledge, dispositions. And it is about assessment being about whether the student has actually learned and demonstrated their knowledge in that concept. So assessment is a meaningful experience for the student. I either got that at a high level or A, B, or try again. And you get immediate support, differentiated support based on how each student's individual learning needs are. So think of it as on a given unit, you either demonstrate proficiency and have some evidence of that learning before advancing, or if you're not quite there yet, you get the help that you need so you're doing that unit recovery and not going over whole courses with the gaps. And last, that we're talking about learning outcomes that emphasize competencies, that include the application transfer of knowledge that includes skills and disposition. So it's academic plus those core problem solving and communication that students will need to be successful in careers and ready for college. So a competency-based education system is built around a growth mindset to ensure that all students reach the highest level all students can learn. This idea of mastery base is about being student-centered versus school-centered, that students move on when they demonstrate mastery, and there are time-bound targets to ensure that all students are reaching those targets in a timely manner based on their age cohort. It fosters intrinsic motivation and builds educator capacity, so our teachers are being empowered to help meet every student's needs, and the system is calibrating the expectations for proficiency across teachers and building that professional judgment and capacity. It's also organized to help personalize learning. How do we meet each student per person's needs? So what, what does this look like? Uh, there's a lot of text on this slide, but it's a at the heart of it is that every student has a personalized learning map or a personalized learning plan where those standards are mapped out for each level of academic plus what students need to know and be able to do to be successful communicators, problem solvers. There are data systems that provide far, far more transparency than many of the traditional uh, grade books that we have today. 
students know where they are, parents know where students are in their learning progression, teachers, educators, and our school leaders have really good access to where each student is, indicating their level of progress, and also the evidence on how they have met the standards. There are rubrics that are clear around what evidence looks like so that teachers and students understand what mastery looks like. Students know their targets, their learning goals, and there's a lot of collaboration with each other and with the adults. Educators and adults in the system are shifting roles. They're coaching, they're grouping and regrouping students, and they're specializing to help students achieve those goals that they need for success. And it's also about learning beyond textbooks. It's about expanding learning opportunities into the community through projects, after school, through internships for high school students, museums. So we're bridging formal and informal learning. It's about what students know or need to learn to be successful. Now how is K-12 competency-based education advancing across the United States? Back when Chris and I started the research uh, and, and did an original literature review in 2010 and 2011, a handful of states had created state policy in support of flexibility from seat time for enabling policy for competency-based education. And in 2012, you'll see there are a group of six states in the Innovation Lab Network that are committed to creating space for districts and local efforts to engage in new designs that empower competency-based learning. You see emerging states that are addressing competency-based education policy and more developing and advanced states that are driving clear policies towards proficiency-based options. Now when we use the term competency-based education, in some states, it's referred to as proficiency-based learning. In some states, it's referred to performance-based learning. Other places, mastery-based learning. The idea is centered around using the term that's appropriate for your locality or for your state. But the ideas are the same, and that is around students advancing upon that demonstrated learning, the evidence, and the broader skills and dispositions. Let's take a quick look at how the field has evolved since 2012. In 2016, you have more than 30 states that have moved policy, and this map is from this year. 2017, you've got 43 states that have advanced policy around enabling conditions for competency-based education. We estimate across the United States the uptake to be Fairly uneven in schools and in districts, there's more and more interest in creating new designs that focus on students' needs and competency-based progressions. But there may be anywhere from 4% to 8% of school districts actively starting to innovate in competency-based education. So this is still early in terms of stages for the field and moving from traditional models to true competency-based education models. So what are the differences and the overlap between personalized learning, competency-based education, and blended learning? With those of you familiar with next generation learning models, we think of competency-based education as the structure or the foundation that ensures that students have the skills and the knowledge they need for success so that you focus on mastery and you focus on making sure that students do not have those gaps and get what they need. It's a solid foundation. When you think about personalized learning, we're thinking about personalized approaches or personalized pathways where we're holding all students to the same high standards to ensure rigor, but students might have personalized approaches to how they learn their math standards or their science standards. When we think of blended learning, you see lots of new models that have blended learning or aspects of online learning. That's simply a delivery model or a delivery modality that can help empower teachers to have the tools that they need to expand access to resources, to better pinpoint the literacy level that a student is 
But the overall educational approach or the pedagogical approach would be personalized and that would be on a competency-based education structure. So this really isn't about blended learning. It's more about the fundamental structure of our education system being focused on mastery and competency and the ability to get all students what they need through personalized approaches. So personalized learning approaches through this report that we published in 2013, we did a scan of the field and developed this definition. It talks about personalized learning is tailoring learning for each student's strengths, needs, and interests. Think of it as per person. And it enables student voice and choice in what, how, when, and where they learn to provide flexibility and the support to ensure mastery of the highest standards possible, holding all students to high standards. So what, what might this look like? We're going to take a look at some different pictures and illustrations of what this can look like. Here is a picture of students the same age that have the same high standards that they're addressing, but they are being given their own pathway. These students are interested in wind energy and alternative energy. So they've designed a project with their teacher to do some field work. And when they're doing this project, they're going to accomplish some critical science standard, address some math standards with the math work that they're doing. They're going to be writing up their findings and addressing some of their English language art standards. And they're also going to be exhibiting and learning skills in teamwork and problem solving. For this, they must be able to demonstrate mastery in each of those areas. And this work on their academic plus other core skills will help prepare them for college and careers of the 21st century. They're also learning. If you walk around classrooms, there may be visible signs kindergartners, elementary school students, middle school students, high school students, they are learning the language of learning. They are being empowered to, what are my learning goals? How do I know that I am accomplishing these bigger ideas of building knowledge, of making meaning, of applying our understanding to be able to exhibit mastery and competency? They're also focusing visibly on these skills and dispositions what are you going to need when you go into the workforce? Creativity, to be responsive, to be resourceful, to be purposeful. You may see this when you're visiting schools that are competency-based. And they're also really focused on student learning goals. What is the next step in their learning progression to get to bigger goals? How do we make sure students are on their pathway? There is also a lot of data and information. So if you look closely at this picture, you'll see it's a modern learning environment that mimics the way many modern businesses work today. There's a lot of creative design work in their goals and their projects, but you can also see loads of data from where students are at their different levels, and they're getting the support they need, and they're engaging in meaningful work both inside of school and outside of school. So this data and transparency around the learning process, where all students are on their learning level and also what their pathway is to successful graduation and diplomas, ensuring that they're ready for the kinds of independent and academic work they'll need in college, but also fostering the skills they need to be successful in careers and in the workplace. And just another picture of these students, some working collaboratively in groups, others working independently, others in breakout groups. Here's another picture of a high school out of Minnesota. These students are, some of them are working on projects, some of them are doing independent work on specific standards. But you see this learning environment very much models the kind of modern learning environments you might see at some of the 21st century workplaces, whether it's design firms, Google, Yahoo, or many others. They're trying to empower students to take on and develop the skills, dispositions, habits of work, and learning how to learn with the supports that they need from adults and working together. 
This is a middle school, Grant Beacon, in Denver Public Schools in Colorado. Now these students are being um, pulled together into small groups of so being able to work on the math skills. This is a math lab um, that they need extra help with, support from. And each of these students, while they are the same age, may be working on two or three different sets of skills with teachers moving back and forth, making sure that every student's needs are being addressed every single day. Well, this is the last example I'll show you. This is a high school. And if you go and you talk to any one of these individual students about what they're working on, they'll tell you. I talked to this 15-year-old boy in the school who said, I'm really interested in artificial intelligence. So I'm doing an analysis of the last 15 years of where artificial intelligence started, where it's going. I'm going to do an analysis and talk to some futurist experts on where it's going, what, what's happening with artificial intelligence robots and the future of jobs. And then I'm going to be addressing um, specific science standards, math standards, English language arts standards, and also some social studies standards on the ethical implications for artificial intelligence on our society and on our future workforce. Well, the students are putting together projects that are relevant to them and also relevant to the world that they're going into for this 21st century global economy uh, where jobs in the future is rapidly changing. So hopefully that provides a snapshot of how different this can look than the learning that takes place in competency-based education models. You know, Competency-based education models, as you saw from those pictures, they have some variations in how they're implemented. So if you're looking across K-12 education, there is a real emphasis on the habits of work and learning, social and emotional learning, academics, as well as higher order skills. You do see these environments organized around age and skills, where there may be one or two different ages, but they're designed around age-based cohorts and performance levels where students are being grouped and regrouped. You see a real focus on applied learning and that transfer of knowledge and creating opportunities for applying knowledge, whether it's projects or work inside of school or outside of school. There's a tremendous focus on actually meeting kids where they are. And that's about building those foundational skills so you make sure that students do not have gaps in their learning also scaffolding for the skills where they need support, but also the ability to advance beyond their traditionally assigned grade level. If students are ready to move on to the next level, they should have that opportunity. We shouldn't be holding our students back. Last, the communicating progress. There are new metrics for what's possible for growth. This has real implications for state policy. If you have more transparency and better information and better evidence of student learning over time, we could think about new metrics for growth, this transparency and improved grading practices to ensure mastery. And thinking about accountability, next-gen accountability, or reciprocal accountability with communities, with state leaders, and ensuring that consistency, transparency, and commitment uh, or success for all students. So competence-based learning is fundamental to this idea of personalizing learning at scale, and it challenges almost all of our assumptions about the present system. With that, Sunny, I will pause and give uh, everyone participating, thank you, um, a chance to type in questions in the chat room, and both Chris and I can respond to the questions. Thank you. Great. We will now, this is Sunny, we will now move into a question and answer period. Please enter your questions into the chat box, and I will ask our speakers to address them. And before we start, I want to mention again that participants can download the PDF of the PowerPoint in the media library um, now, um, up on the right-hand corner where that play button is. Um, and also that the presentation will be recorded and available on the same page where you registered. Um, so um, I wanted to start with a question, Susan and Chris, about um, 
age and grade banding, um, because it's a question that I often hear legislators raise. Um, what happens if you have um, a child who's taking a long time to meet the standards, sort of how far um, can they go be below sort of their age and grade? Um, and or, you know, what is the impact of having mixed age groups versus same age groups and, and sort of the extent to which this is um, critical to the concept of competency-based education? Susan, you want me to start? Please. Okay. Um, so it's important to know that it's not required in any sense to move to multi-age bands or to organize schools only around performance levels. In fact, 95 or more, 95 percent or more of the schools I visit are still using age-based grades. What they're doing, though, that is different is that they pay attention to where students are in their own learning, and they group and regroup, or called flexible grouping, around students' needs to be able to really meet students where they are and make sure that they have the skills they need to advance. So I just read an article about a school in Idaho that was an elementary school, and I hear this story a lot, where the teachers start to really pay attention to where students are in terms of their skills about learning to, lead, to read, and these are almost like sub standard skills. And by grouping and regrouping and making sure that students have every part of the skill they're going to need to be able to read and to be able to do it well, kids make big jumps and pretty soon everybody is reading. That's very different than trying to teach every student the same skill at the same time. And so that's what we most often see. There are a few schools that are now starting to do multi-age banding it primarily is two grades together. Um, and what the biggest value seems to be that it really helps the teachers detach the performance levels from the age-based grades so that they start to really learn how to meet students where they are, how to organize the classrooms more around students' needs. And uh, they, so you're really focusing on skill level more than, oh, we're going to just advance you at the end of the year because, you're, 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 uh, because of your birthday. So it's really important to not assume that this means that every student is going to be grouped all the time by their performance level. And it's also really, really important to remember that a student might, in fifth grade, might be doing math at third performance level and reading at the seventh. And so that even when we think about students, we, it's not across the board where they are in their performance level, that that's going to be uh, something that changes. And Susan, Chris, would you like to add anything? No, I, I, I think that's a, that was a great comprehensive answer. I mean, I do think this, this notion of when you're in a traditional system and you end up having all of these gaps, so then you get into, students get into high school and the gaps are massive, you see even bigger variation when you're talking about a competency-based system, the whole purpose here is to ensure kids have mastery and so that you're filling in um, you know, all of the necessary requisites on those performance levels so you don't have such widespread gaps. Um, it's it just like an example from visiting a, a fifth grade fifth grade classroom in Maine in a competency-based the students are the same age. They've got this big, what they call it, capacity matrix on the wall, which has all of the students' names, and then across like 12 different levels of standards. And the students can see where they are. They can see where they are in relation to other students. And they know that if they're struggling in one area, but Bobby had done that um, unit uh, two weeks before, and they really love the way Bobby explains that to them, they can get help from teachers and from students, and like they're all staying within a, a relative group. So you're actually keeping all students without those gaps in these relative cohorts together in a much more productive way. And the teachers are explaining 
this is really far more effective and efficient as a model because now I'm not guessing how far off is, you know, any one of my or are any one of my 27 students, I know exactly where they are and they're all helping each other and like they're all getting what they need every day and, and, that's, and that's powerful. We have a couple of questions from commissioners uh, from the Student-Centered Learning Commission, and I thought I would start with kind of what we were just talking about a little bit, um, the, how students are responsible for documenting their own progress in learning. And so will you share a couple of examples that might um, provide a picture of what that looks like? Sure. So what you'll hear about in competency-based schools is language about student agency, language about students owning their learning. And there's two parts to that. One is really investing and making sure that students have the skills in order to take responsibility for their own learning. So that's the growth mindset. It's not just believing that you can learn, but also having the skills to allow you to do that, which is metacognition, self-talk, you know, that little inner voice that we have, yes, you can do it, yes, you can do it. Learning how to be, actually be able to manage that, all the social-emotional aspects, being able to know what you're feeling, manage it, figure out how to um, ask for help, all those sets of skills are really important. The other part are practices that allow students to have more agency and take responsibility. So. I've, I love going to the elementary schools because the students take so much ownership. And what you'll see often is on the wall, students will be able to move a pin or put some type of a um, mark on, the, on a chart to show that they have learned something. And they can talk to you about where they were, what they're working on now, how they're going to learn, what they're going to do to demonstrate their learning, and how they'll get the extra help if they need it. And they can actually tell you, talk to you about this at age you know, six, seven, first, second, mm -hmm. second grade. Um, and in some systems, they have electronic student information systems. And so you can be talking to students in middle school or high school, and they can talk to you about, I had some gaps. You know, let's say a ninth grader will say, I had some gaps in my seventh grade math that were really tripping me up. And when I say seventh grade, excuse me, seventh performance level, right? So it's not just the grade, but it's the performance level. And I had some gaps. They were tripping me up in the ninth grade, ninth performance level math course. So I had to go back and learn those. And now I'm advancing much more rapidly because I have the basic skills. And then you can say, so how, let's say they are still a performance level below where you think they should be. You can talk to them about what their plan is to be able to keep building the school, the skills they need in order to graduate. And they'll, they might say, yes, this summer I'm going to do an internship, and I'm hoping to really build up my writing skills during that time of that internship so that when I come back into school, I'll be more ready. So you can have these very precise conversations with the students about how they're managing their learning. And of course, it's a process to learn this, right? It's, it doesn't happen right away. So there's much, the time teachers is often more reflecting on how are you doing as a learner and where, what skills or habits of success do you need to focus on? Maybe students need to put more time and energy into their work. Uh, maybe they need to learn how to ask for help and know when that time is that they, just by struggling more isn't going to get them any farther. So th there's that type of reflection so that they really become great lifelong learners. Well, thank you. And thank you, Representative Heath, for that excellent question. Let me pose one more question um, before we move on, and that is from Representative Simon Idaho. Um, what needs to be done to have our colleges and universities recognize competencies versus a grade point for admission? Yes. So we've taken, we're seeing a lot of progress in the, especially in New England, um, from Great Schools Partnership and the New England Secondary Schools Consortium about being able to get a commitment from higher ed 
um, in terms of the college admissions process to not let the fact that somebody went to a proficiency-based school be any way a problem. And schools and colleges are making that pledge very quickly. They don't have any problem doing that. It would be great to have every college and university in the country make that. The trick on the grade point average primarily seems to be more about scholarships and related to the NCAA. Um, and for us to totally move away from the grade point average, we probably, I'm just, this is my personal reflection, we probably need to get to some type of bands of honor level bands or you know sort of exemplary work bands because students are going to want a way to distinguish themselves but we need to have that be related to their actual learning and not to that point scale because the point scale in the traditional system is not actually related to their learning and this is always we have to remember this that students in schools that are not teaching kids above a kind of a 10th grade level still are coming out with a 4.2 GPA. But mm -hmm. it doesn't actually relate to, it doesn't tell you to what level, performance level, they've really learned. So we need um, a, a stronger set of data to give us different information about where kids really are and what they've learned. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing is we want to make sure that the, it's not including just uh, behaviors, which at that point score in the traditional system may include you turned your homework in on time and you brought in cans for the, can, um, for the food drive. But that doesn't really tell you very much about learning either. It, um, so it's, it's really important that we do get this, this um, a way of doing this it is what we see happen in the high schools that become competency based is that they will have to have some way of uh, there will be some algorithm that will take the proficiency based scores that are related to learning and turn them into a GPA. As long as it's transparent, I mean, it, it's, it, it doesn't help build the intrinsic motivation. It definitely, it's not something that is healthy for this new system, but it's being done all the time because we have to. But as long as it's transparent, the students will understand and they will play by whatever rules that are created. The difficulty is the competency-based education really depends on transparency and respect and telling students where they are and being totally invested in their learning. And all, all of a sudden it becomes not transparent, which happens in some of the great electronic grade books and becomes confusing, the students will get bit. But the, the top 10% of your students um, academically will get very upset. So it sounds like a policy to keep our eyes on and to keep, um, keep thinking about as we do. Yeah, it's, I think it's really important. It's not stopping us from moving forward, but it would be great for us to figure out another way of doing this. Yeah, and Sunny, this is Susan. I think most public and private four-year universities do accept proficiency-based diplomas or alternative diplomas. They certainly have a background um, with evaluating students that were homeschooled, for example, and don't have a traditional diploma. And there's really interesting work being done, actually. You might have seen this announcement in the last um, month or so that for our um, high schools, the private elite high schools, so the top, top tier, are now working, over 100 of those most competitive private elite high schools are working with colleges on proficiency-based diplomas and moving away. So there, there is, there is uh, some momentum happening right now. Okay, great. Well, Susan, I'll hand it back over to you for the next portion of the webinar. Thanks. Great, thanks. So we're going to examine the state policy uh, around the opportunities in the Every Student Succeeds Act for competency-based education. And of course, the intention by Congress of the Every Student Succeeds Act from December 2015 was to turn the power back to states and localities to give them the flexibility they need in setting a future education system. So with the law passed, um, we have created, uh, just as a reference and a resource, 
um, how we might meet the promise for the Every Student Succeeds Act and look at state policy to support competency-based and personalized learning. Um, in this, we outline opportunities that are new under the Every Student Succeeds Act. And we know that each and every state is working on either developing their state plan or continuing to think about ways they need to help change their state policy on education, which is the primary, the primary locus of policy for K-12 education is state by state. And really starting to rethink next-gen models for accountability, and states are barely there right now. But rethinking from no child left behind to what is possible under ESSA for continuous improvement and moving the system forward to modernize it to ensure it's competency-based. Part of this is the ability to rethink and redesign systems plural of assessments, plural that help empower students and educators with assessments for learning, and that align to student-centered learning, as well as provide that transparency and comparability. And how can we think about, with highly qualified teacher provisions of No Child Left Behind gone, they are gone, how do we build capacity for a next generation leaders and educator workforce? Well, there are opportunities in the law, certainly, to develop competency-based and personalized education systems. There is a focus on expanding access to educational opportunities. Um, and thought was put into building the infrastructure to support new learning models across the law. So when we think about what is possible in your state now under ESSA, you may have your states working on state plans, but please know there is an important provision in the Every Student Succeeds Act in Section 1111A, that an FDA or state agency may submit a request to amend its state plan at any time. And the purpose of this was really to move from the federal law being focused entirely on compliance to one that allows the state to try new frameworks for state policy under ESSA and do continuous improvement. So amendments to your state plan will be allowed on a rolling basis, and those may or may not be subject to the peer review process. Uh, that could sound really technical. But I, this is an opportunity for communities across your state to have deep conversations around what students need to be prepared for the 21st century workforce for college and careers and broader definitions of student success for the whole child. Then think about what accountability looks like and at what level. What do communities and local leaders need to know? What do state leaders really need to know? And what data do they need to have? And what does the federal government need to know and have? And align this entire system with the appropriate assessments at the appropriate level so we're focusing more on assessments for learning and ensuring that we're meeting every student's needs and developing a process for continuous improvement across the system. So what are the state policy strategies that legislators can use to advance competency education? And here is kind of a roadmap. Like if you're a state just getting started or you're a state that's been getting started with some flexibility but moving forward, and then states that have been at this for maybe decades taking a more comprehensive approach. And you may be at different places in your own state in your state. So I'm so pleased um, that we have states that are starting to create as an entry point innovation zones for competency-based education. Let's give some support to those district leaders that are ready to move forward with competency-based education models and allow the state and the state Department of Ed, quite frankly, kind of shift their role to supporting innovation 
so that when districts run into state policies that are barriers in the way, the districts have permission to raise these with state policy leaders, legislators, with their state ed leaders, and say, we're really running into this outdated licensure policy or another particular policy, flag those, and then work to resolve those in fixing the regulations or running legislation to help remove the barriers and provide support to high-quality, competency-based education. Some states are engaging in task forces to bring all different constituencies and stakeholders around the table to discuss their understanding of competency-based education and the pathway forward appropriate to your state and your communities. Uh, certainly, many states have moved from seat time to create credit flexibility for competency-based pathways or pilot programs. I'm so pleased um, to see in Idaho uh, the move from a task force to some competency-based education pilots and thinking about how the state can help support multiple pathways to graduation. Um, we have some states like Maine and Colorado that have moved forward with proficiency-based diplomas. Um, doing that too soon without the flexibility for your district can sometimes result in um, the policy getting ahead of where practitioners are. So you want to be really careful to create these pathways to support innovators in practice, so our, our leaders, our superintendents, our educators, in beginning and getting started and learning where they need to build capacity and move forward. It's really important that states start thinking about how they can modernize their systems of assessment. And so we're moving from this compliance to continuous improvement and building local capacity. So those are some key ways that we see across that map of the United States. Well, leading states are using different strategies, and it has to be appropriate for your state. But some key ways this is happening are state leadership on new definitions of student success as the North Star or Beacon, uh, profile of a graduate work, some new models of accountability. Those are um, uh, states, I think it's still early on to see what some next-gen models might look like. We're certainly seeing a lot of progress in states starting with pilots for competency-based education and this idea of task force and innovation zones I just mentioned. And thinking about, uh, there's a project called the Assessment for Learning Project, which is trying to really rethink how we build capacity for assessments for learning. So, for performance assessments or where students are creating rich evidence that's meaningful through projects, um, building up the capacity in our state to do that important work. Well, fundamental to this is what do our students need to know and be able to do to be successful in this very rapidly changing workforce they're entering now? And are they really ready to go in and be successful in college? So in redefining student success, I'm just going to focus on this. This is a real um, call to action in the Every Student Succeeds Act and an opportunity for local stakeholders to come together um, to really uh, functionally talk about the academic plus other skills students are going to need and know and be able to do. So bringing together civic leaders, bringing together workforce leaders, bringing together parents, educators and students. And um, as you'll see in a couple of examples, there are uh, opportunity for states to lead work developing this idea of a profile of a graduate that can drive the system redesign conversation. We think that in a competency-based education system, this is really critical as a foundation before you can even start talking about next-gen models of accountability or what a meaningful student-centered assessment um, approach might look like. So here are two great examples. A profile of a, a graduate in Virginia, um, statewide uh, localities, communities engaged in deep conversations around what students need to know and be able to do. And they came up with this map that includes the content knowledge. We're not moving away from content knowledge. Um, it's 
it's a it's a linchpin. It's part of the Venn diagram. But we care a lot about the workplace skills also, and the ability for students within their K through 12 experiences to have career exploration, to do more work in internships, to be able to get involved in civic responsibilities, uh, and do more in community engagement. How can we demonstrate our knowledge, skills, and abilities and a competency-based model across all of these domains? Students are truly ready. So they unpack this a bit more with the underlying idea of building critical thinking and creative thinking, communication and citizenship. Again, it's the content knowledge plus these other very important skills. In South Carolina, they have also done a project uh, around profile of a graduate where they're focused again uh, on world-class knowledge, these skills, and life and career characteristics students will need to so in wrapping up, when you have this profile of a graduate and broader definition of student success, then that is the lead gear in beginning our next steps of rethinking accountability for continuous improvement. And just I'm going to plug again the opportunity for your state in your state plans to have amendments in the future. So maybe your state plan isn't fully comprehensive and future focused right now. Maybe it's just a step different than No Child Left Behind. You have the opportunity to keep pushing this and amend your state plan to be more focused on this broader definition of success and rethinking accountability with input from stakeholders to think differently about the purposes, the metrics that might make more sense, to think about how you might approach school improvement strategies and capacity building. Well, we really want to think about the conversation in the competency-based education system structure as really being able to focus. Let's go back and focus on assessments for learning and of learning to help support our educators, to help support our students and our families. So know that in the Every Student Succeeds Act that we now not just have, we don't just have some of the assessments, but we can have these systems that can include some of the assessments, but also interim assessments and more formative assessments. It also can help us in, by including adaptive items so we can see where students' levels are when they're entering and rich performance tasks that will produce evidence projects. So performance tasks and performance assessments are now allowed. These things are all allowed, and that is very different than what we had before. Last but not least, there is a provision in the Every Student Succeeds Act to allow states that want to pilot innovative accountability and assessment um, pilots or demonstrations with a smaller subset of districts that are ready to start moving. And this was focused on many of the states that might have a group of six or ten districts working on competency-based education models that desperately need some flexibility to try new models of accountability and assessment aligned to student-centered learning. And this authority is in Section 1204 in ESSA. Last but certainly not least, are the needs to build capacity with our educator workforce system, thinking about what might it look like for competency-based educator preparation programs. What are the competencies that leaders need to lead this change? Can we provide multiple pathways for credentials or micro-credentials and aligning evaluations with these broader goals? So thanks to the states that are taking the lead on creating innovation zones, states like Colorado and Kentucky, taking a look at the development of this policy, the great work that's happening in Utah and Idaho um, and across the U.S. and making this progress to newly define student success. So that is a lot of information related to state policy. And uh, Sunny, I'd be happy to turn it back over to you. Uh, Chris and I will be, be happy to engage in answering questions. Fantastic. 
And Chris has been doing a beautiful job moderating a really robust conversation over there in the chat box. Um, so there's, it's natural of resources for further learning for all of our participants um, and great links for more reading. There was um, one question. We, I, I just wanted to jump in, Susan. There was one question about international competencies and if there's ever been an effort to kind of align them across countries. I know the U.S. hasn't done that, but do you have any thoughts about that? Well, so there, there have been, and the OECD has some very interesting resources. So Andrea Schleicher is best known for his PISA international rankings. Um, can reference actually in across the European Union and the European Commission, they have for many years been working on an overall competency framework. Um, and it's the overall competency framework of the knowledge, skills, and dispositions. There's been some significant work internationally on the idea of what it means to redefine success. And there isn't one specific answer to the question on how would you redefine student success, but there has been quite a bit of research on how dramatically changing the definitions of student success from just being focused on narrow or broad content knowledge alone has shifted towards these, um, your ability to apply your knowledge, your ability to solve problems. And curriculum frameworks in the highest performing countries um, including our neighbors to the north in Canada, in British Columbia and Alberta, including Finland, including Sweden, including New Zealand, um, are really looking at curricular frameworks that are focused on skills, dispositions, learning how to learn, and a core set of, of content knowledge that can be approached from an interdisciplinary, really problem-solving point of view and to help map into, uh, we didn't even talk about this, but in higher ed and future workforce certification and skills in promising jobs. So the short answer is yes, there has been some work, and I can um, help follow up with anyone on, on that. Thanks, Susan. We are super interested in international comparisons um, given NCSL's work with the International Study Group. So we'll uh, keep, keep looking at that. Um, one final question from Representative Santos up in Washington State. How long did it take for Virginia and South Carolina to develop their respective profiles of a graduate? Um, and we'll stop after this question and wrap up and um, follow up with folks other questions as need be. So um, go ahead with that. Thanks. Yeah, the quick answer to that question is about 12 to 18 months. I know it really was a call to action from communities and local school districts. Um, uh, I hate to say begging the state, um, begging the State Board of Ed and the State Department of Ed to engage in the work um, that literally was driven locally from the ground up and became a statewide in initiative. In South Carolina, they have been working to encourage innovation, and they actually have a, a nonprofit third party business education um, compact in Colorado. You have the Colorado Education Initiative, which is like a third party um, partner that bridges business and education, leading this type of work. Um, but these conversations around profile of a graduate aren't meant to be um, just done once and then dropped. But in their work leading up to this 12 or 18 months to develop these um, really important new ideas. Uh, again, internationally, we see these profile of a graduate conversations taking place both, both at the local and community level and at whatever the main role of oversight in the U.S. that would be a state in some of these other countries. Um, it would be at a ministry level. All right, thanks. Um, so with that, I want to point out um, Chris and Susan's um, contact information. And thanks to Chris and Susan. And thanks also to the Nellie May Education Foundation and our sponsor, the NCSL Student Centered Learning Commission. And thanks to all of you who participated uh, for joining us today. We encourage you to 
stay connected and get in touch uh, if we can be of assistance to you. Um, so here's a link where you can find more information um, about the archived version of this, this uh, webinar today. So that's where you'll find a link to the video as well as the slide deck within the next few days. Um, and where you can learn more about the NCSL Student Centered Learning Commission and my contact information. Um, and again, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available on the NCSL website next week. And uh, we thank you again. And this webinar is now concluded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.